what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. This podcast is sponsored by the 2019 Foot Candle Film Festival. This year's film festival will be held September 27th through 29th in Hickory, North Carolina. Learn more by visiting footcandlefilmfestival.com. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. My name is Alan Jackson. I am the co-founder and co-director of the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival. Chris Fry is with me as always, uh, my partner in crime, my co-host across the table here, also the co-founder and co-director of the aforementioned Foot Candle Film Society and Foot Candle Film Festival. Chris, how are you doing? Doing good. Ready to talk about movies. Yes. I think let's do that in this show. Let's let's change <laughs> it up not? a little bit. And let's talk movies. <laughs> sure. Well, no, in all honesty, my movies is pretty much all we talk about on this show. So for those of you just now listening to us, we are uh, Foot Candle Films. We do a couple of reviews during the course of the episode. We'll be reviewing some newer films that we think uh, we want to share our opinions on. Then we'll be moving into some movie news items. Those will be some things just hitting the news nowadays that we want to talk about for either upcoming film projects, interesting uh, director projects, or just some films we want to keep on our radar. Then we'll finish up the show with our recommendations of the episode. And this is where Chris and I each give a film that we either recently just caught back up with, got to see for the first time, wanted to bring some attention to, maybe it was overlooked, maybe it's been forgotten, and we just want to kind of bring it back to the forefront and uh, give some recommendations of a film that you may enjoy or want to check out if you have some free time. So, Chris, we've got a full show today. We are going to be reviewing two films and then going into our news and recommendations. And I'm ready for us to go into our first review, if you are. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. The first review is filmed by first-time director and written by star Jimmy Fails. Uh, the director is Joe Talbot. And the film is The Last Black Man in San Francisco. We built these ships. Threads these canals. In the San Francisco they never knew existed. This is our home. You two stick together. So, Chris, we have first-time director Joe Talbot and a childhood friend of his, uh, Jimmy Fails. Uh, working together on a film uh, is the first film these two have done. And uh, based on a uh, their real story growing up, supposedly, at least they wrote the story together uh, based on their own childhood and youth experiences. The Last Black Man in San Francisco talks about a young man who's searching for a home in the changing city that seems to have left him behind, according to the IMDb description here. We follow Jimmy... Jimmy Fails, played by Jimmy Fails, and his best friend, Mont Montgomery Allen, played by Jonathan Majors, as they uh, explore a fascination that Jimmy has with a particular house in San Francisco, a very uh, elegant, beautiful, historic house that he has some personal history with and a personal fascination with. But along the way, we're also exploring what it means to be living in San Francisco, uh, the, the changes the city has been going through over the last several generations some forms of gentrification that may be happening within the city. We deal with homelessness. We deal with even some other themes like family and what it means to be someone uh, kind of working within a definition of who people in society feel like you're, you're meant to be. A lot of things being covered. The question I want to ask you, Chris, is uh, you, know, you and I decide on the films we bring to our film society every month. And we always make it a, a, a goal to bring a film that we have not seen, but we have either heard about or gotten recommended to us. This is a film you've been championing pretty hard. So I dare say you maybe were going in with some elevated expectations. My question to you is, did it hit those expectations or did it fall short? And if it fell short, uh, why did that happen? Well, I think 
this is an, one of those examples where I went in with extremely high expectations. And my immediate response to the film when the credits started rolling was one of being let down. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I just had I'd heard so many good things. Uh, the trailer, which you played a little bit of, but of course our viewers did not see it, for this is audio-only podcast. <laughs> but uh, the cinematography in the trailer, the music in the trailer, the editing of the trailer, just everything seemed to be clicking. So I was, you know, I was expecting to have a Cloud9 experience. Um, and I didn't quite have that. Mm-hmm. However, as I have sat with the film, not even for 24 hours yet, um, it has kind of stuck with me. Mm-hmm. So it's not something, it's not a film I will dismiss or say I didn't like. It's just it kind of fell short of maybe what I was hoping it would be. Um, but something that definitely lived up to the expectations that I went into the film with was the cinematography. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the cinematography in the film is amazing. Uh, it's kind of a complex love letter to San Francisco. I say complex because it does showcase all this exquisite architecture and a lot of pretty scenes with like the bridge and things, but it also documents the wide disparity between the haves and the have nots, which sometimes is not very beautiful. So it, it, it's, it's not like it's a total postcard rose colored glasses. Nothing's wrong with this area, but it also doesn't just make it look dirty, dinging and depressing. So mm-hmm. it's, it walks the fine line. And I, the cinematography just throughout was outstanding and really kind of, did live up to what I was expecting. Mm-hmm. Expectation wise, your overall impression, how did you come out on the film? Well, I did not go in with quite the expectation level you did. Um, and I've seen it twice. And I do think that has an impact. Okay. Um, I, I love this film. Okay. I think it's beautiful. I think it's raw and emotional, but also stylish and quirky. Um, has a lot to say. Um, I do have a few misgivings that we'll talk about in a little bit, as I'm sure you, you probably do as well. Some things I felt like maybe it wasn't as focused and had a lot more themes trying to pack in than maybe it was really warranted to do. But everything else worked for me. Performances, cinematography, as you already mentioned. Um, the tone of the film was so fascinating to me to vacillate between just raw and abrasive and kind of angry to really soft, sweet, and emotional, and just, uh, it really worked for me. It was a very unique film. Um, it is uniquely paced. It's uniquely toned. Um, Sounds like you had the experience I was hoping to have. Yeah, I think we kind of <laughs> had a little swap there. So yeah. I really did like it. And I will say I enjoyed it. I appreciated it a lot more the second viewing. Okay. And so I've it is it one, once. I think it is one that works on you over time because okay. I probably came out a little more lukewarm on it after the first viewing. So if that tells you anything there, it's a film that I think warrants multiple viewings and uh, rewards it because there were more nuances I picked up the second time that I did not the first time. And knowing what kind of film it was going to be watching it the second time, I knew what to expect. So I was really looking to just have it, you know, have it wow me with what it was, how it was telling the story. And it did so much more the second time. So I'm, I'm really high on the film. I really, after the, the second viewing and after really thinking about it, I'm, I I think it's a wonderfully made film. The fact that it's still a first time film for this director to me is impressive. Um, you know, it's not perfect, but it, uh, it shows a lot of promise and a lot of talent behind the camera. So I was really happy with that. I think Jimmy fails, you know, He's an actor. I mean, he's maybe a storyteller. You're 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 raising your eyebrows, but I thought he was really good. Um, and I liked his uh, his friend, you know, played by uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Major is also very good. Overall, I like the performances in the film. I like. I mean, the things I, I I have some misgivings were truly were just about trying to tackle so many themes and so many topics in a singular film, and I felt like it maybe watered them all down more than they needed to be. They all had some overlap, some connective tissue between them, but I still felt like at the end of the film, I I could have picked three or four different themes that I felt like it was trying to make statements on. And I kind of wish it had maybe more honed in and focused on one or two that were the most important to the film. But, um, yeah, that's that's where I am with this. I think we did have a switched and a switched appreciation for the film here. You mentioned the fact that, you know, 
it being the director's first feature. He'd done a short prior to yeah. this, but this was his first feature. And I think I, I went in, I think that's where my hangups lie because it, to me, I just was res- reminded basically every 20 minutes or so, this is a director's first feature. Hmm. And it just really stuck out to me. I think where it was most obvious was I thought it was really indulgent with the running time. And it's kind of an odd first feature for me because I don't think I ever remember somebody's first feature being two hours. And I think that hmm. I wonder, I think overall, you know, we've, I've complained about running time in here mm-hmm. ad nauseum. It's mm-hmm. like a drinking game among our listeners probably. But I think, you know, you mentioned in the setup to the film last night when we screened it for our film society, how they, the history behind it was mm-hmm. they'd try to do it for $25,000 um, thousand. Thousand mm-hmm. and they did a campaign kickstart and everything and they got seventy five. And, you know, it's kind of like they were given the keys to the kingdom from the get go. And I think for a, a beginning filmmaker, this being their first feature, maybe that actually hindered them to have more access, to have more money, to have more because it let them kind of expand maybe further than they should have. I'll never know because this is the first film and it's over and done with. But it just, Mm -hmm. you know, some of the things that were shown in the trailer, the cinematography, it all was all beautiful. The beginning has kind of this magical realism to it a little bit. And I feel like that was basically dropped. And I don't know if that was something when they got all this money, they're like, oh, okay, now we can shoot this really cool intro with some slow motion dolly shots. And I I liked it, Mm -hmm. but then it was distracting because it was in the first five minutes and then disappeared. There's another kind of throwaway shot of a, I think it was a three eyed fish. (laughs) Two eyed, two two eyed on one side, two eyed on one side. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of odd and it was, you know, but there was either not enough of that I guess I'm saying there wasn't enough of it. So like either strip it out mm. or put more of it in. And mm. it just, because I really like, like I were, really like magical realism. Yeah. So I, I felt like there were some more. other moments that started to, to flirt with that idea a bit. Maybe it didn't go quite as far as it did in those first few minutes, but um, I, 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 I was, I was still fine with the balance that struck all the way through. There are a few moments. I'll, I'm not going to spoil some scenes later in the film, but even a moment, uh, probably in the latter third of the film, stepping off of a bus to a smoke-filled environment, which, uh, you know, they kind of give some explanation of where the smoke's coming from, but it leads into a scene, uh, an encounter with some of the other people that are always hanging out on the street there. I had a little, you know, little moments like that where they tried to bring in some of that more uh, fantastical elements of just not quite knowing what's going on and not knowing how you're supposed to feel on things. I think they hinted at it in a few other places, maybe not as overtly as they did in that first five minutes. Yeah, but, I guess yeah. that just didn't, that mm. didn't hit and resonate in the same way and didn't, didn't work yeah. for me. You mentioned the acting in the film. Mm. Um, I felt like it's, it's tough to say because this is one of those films that although it is not in the mumblecore genre like the film we reviewed last week, The Sort of Trust, mm-hmm. but it's where dialogue doesn't really seem to be that important for the most part. And it's just kind of like mm. throw away... I mean, there is some, of course, it's not like a silent film, but it there's not a lot of conversations. This is not a Tarantino film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you're not going to mm-hmm. latch on to a lot of conversation. There are... I'll get to one or two phrases that did end up resonating with me. But overall, it just... There wasn't enough moving the story along for me. There wasn't enough hmm. plot. It was over two hours. There weren't interesting dialogue. Literally, the cinematography is what kept me interested. Wow. The acting, I felt like it wasn't bad, but because there wasn't a lot of dialogue going on, I actually felt like Jimmy Fails, although he's fine, he was just very flat. He wasn't hmm. really giving me anything. Wow. Um, the one person that I will say that I was moved by or really noticed was actually the guy who plays uh, Montgomery Allen, Jonathan Majors. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really, he did an amazing job because all throughout the film, he's this kind of a little bit of a soft spoken eccentric playwright Mm -hmm. who's a longtime friend of the lead character. And I don't know, something about his performance was seemed a little bit too mannered or seemed a little bit too affected or something. But there comes a point where this playwright puts on a play. Mm -hmm. 
And prior to going on to put on the play, somebody says something like, oh, are you nervous now? Are you stuttering? And kind of, kind of calls out a little bit. But when that guy gets on stage and does the play, it is like night and day. And the, that arc, that shift really surprised me. I was like, mm-hmm. whoa. Then it kind of jumped out as being this tremendous performance. Mm-hmm. Um, so that really kind of... See, I thought won, the performance won me over, yeah. won me over a little bit. See, I thought his happened. performance built to that so effectively, in that, and maybe if I'd seen it a second time, yeah. I would, I would have interpreted some of the stuff that I was having misgivings about early on that way. Could but be. it didn't really hit me the bravado of the performance mm-hmm. until I got to see that culminating event, and then I kind of realized, oh wow, I've been misjudging this actor and misjudging this character mm-hmm. <laughs> throughout the film. So. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, you know, yes, it is. You can tell these are not actors that have been acting for, for years and big studio pieces before, but I think they fit the material really well as well, I guess. And, and of course, I mean, hard it, to say Jimmy Fields doesn't fit. The I was going to say, <laughs> I, I, I could feel his personal attachment to the work, even if maybe his acting chops are not, you know, completely refined. I do feel like I felt enough of an emotional attachment to the story that he was passionate about that it came across in the camera for me. So, well, and yeah. I guess you know, here again, don't have a second viewing. Maybe I'll judge it differently. But I think that I did go in knowing that Jimmy fails. This was based on you mm-hmm. know his experiences and that he was a writer on it. And I guess that hindered me because I guess maybe I've been trained by Hollywood. I wanted a stronger performance. I mm. wanted something. Yeah. And I felt like it was very flat. And so I guess the whole nagging thing in my mind the whole time was, it's a shame he didn't step away and put somebody else hmm. in this role. Because I feel like maybe sometimes maybe there, was, like a dis- maybe too close. there was a disconnect. Yeah, mm. because maybe he was too close. He was worried about, even though his friend was the one directing it, maybe he it was just, it was too much know. going on. But there again, it's a first feature for him as well yeah. in acting, correct? Uh, yeah. So I think maybe he was in the short film that Joe Talbot did okay. as well, but his first feature, I believe. So, well, I tell you, I, I, I still, I'm still, I'm a big fan, big okay. fan of the film. I, uh, think it's covers a lot of grounds. I mean, I'd mentioned some of the themes earlier that it does cover again. My misgiving is I feel like it tries to cover too much ground with these storylines, but, uh, you do have this concept of, you know, the fact that in San Francisco home prices are so expensive and it's such a competitive market for, rich people to buy these houses and it is pushing back out people who are not of that upper echelon wealth wise out onto the fringes of the city. And you see, especially I will say, I think the first five minutes is probably my favorite part of the movie. Agreed. Now I, I still felt, <laughs> but that's difficult. When I you felt have very hour good. 55 left to go. <laughs> I still like the other hour 55, sure. but I will say that opening five was my favorite sure, because it did such a great job of establishing the tone, the mood and the placement You know, we see them on one side of the city, cresting a hill, seeing the the big part of the city, the more, you know, the the part of the city everybody's familiar with, and then them traveling the streets on there and encountering some different characters and people. And it was great. It was really shot well, and it was very uh, timed to the music really well. So it was a great opening scene. Um, And, you know, there's a lot of talk about, there's a lot of conversation about family. I think, you know, Jimmy you get the sense from his character he's equating a house with the sense of home and family and how those two overlap and, and, and how similar they are meant to be. Um, interesting thing, kind of commenting on this idea of manhood, which I kind of picked up on, which was, yeah. you know, there are some some uh, fellows who basically hang out outside of Mort, uh, Mon, uh, Montgomery's grandfather's house kind of on the street there. The and Greek they're chorus just, gang. The Greek chorus. They're basically <laughs> commenting on what's going on in their lives and in the film in general, sure. making a lot of harsh comments about our two main characters and just being the people who are just going to um, try to put people down around them and, and be very, very abrasive and negative at times. But to see their definition of what it is to be a man and how Mont Montgomery is either trying to emulate them or trying to learn from them and try to discover who he needs to be. You think that's what's going on. And then you learn later in the film that he's really practicing for something he's going to put on play wise. So it was just some interesting commentary on, on some of those themes as well. Again, maybe too many, maybe, you know, we even have the whole love, love story to, to San Francisco. 
there's a line in the film that I think kind of sums up this theme, which is you're not allowed to hate the city unless you love it, which is this idea of, you know, people who flock to the city, but then spread a negativity and negative vibe about the place they live when his comment is, well, unless you love it, then you really can't hate it. You know, that was my, the line that I alluded to earlier, that was my favorite line of the film. It is. It's a good line. It really is. And it's a good scene too, where it plays out too. just, he overhears some, some other people talking about the city and, you know, it's kind of like, Oh, you say you feel about, you know, brothers or sisters or siblings that, you know, you can talk trash about them all day long, but if you hear somebody outside of the family talking bad about your brother or sister, you're very defensive and you don't, they don't have a right to do that. Sure. It's very much the same with like a city, I think. And so a lot of themes, uh, I, I do wish maybe it honed in on a couple of them and really focused on those uh, instead of trying to bring everything in. But I almost feel like it was a, hey, we've got this chance to make this film and here's everything we want to say in the film. So let's try to say everything we can in one two hour film. And I think it works. But again, if I had some some feedback, it would just be maybe streamline and focus in on those things that you really want to say and save some of these other things for another film that you could do down the road. So um, I'll say to you, you know, I don't want to come off as being the person who hates the film. I don't hate it. Um, I think expectations played a part in diminishing my returns. But something we haven't touched on yet that in addition to the cinematography that stuck out to me is the music oh, yeah. of the film, the soundtrack. Uh, I thought it did an extraordinary amount of heavy lifting, especially coupled with the cinematography. Um, it just, it was awesome. I thought, you know, there's, you hear the, one of the songs in the trailer, kind of this mournful instruments mm-hmm. playing. It just, they did a really good job mm-hmm. with it. And I think we mentioned that opening sequence, um, but then there's some shots of a, I guess for lack of a better term, a street preacher Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, who's actually not preaching on like the gospel, but actually kind of the what's being done to the city and what's being done to some of the people of the city. That was really effective to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, I'm wondering what you thought about the shots, some extended skateboarding shots Mm -hmm. gliding down the streets. It really reminded me of something from last year, a documentary, Minding the Gap, Mm -hmm. that won the Academy Award. Sure. (laughs) Um, it just really was very reminiscent. Well, of that. it's that in, in a good way, but added to the fact that San Francisco just has such a unique topography, and sure. you know, with the hills and the the, the world famous kind of you know the steep inclines on the roads. So seeing people follow, you know, having some great skateboarding shots and putting them in that environment was also fun to see. So yeah. nicely done as well. I will say there was, uh, you know, I always like to kind of call out whenever I think they really nail a scene that worked for me. Okay. And, you know, uh, it, it could have been, it could have traipsed into overly schmaltzy sentimentality, but it worked for me. And it worked both nights I saw it. Actually, okay. the second night I was really looking forward to seeing that scene. Um, there's an act of violence that is off screen that we don't see, but it affects a character in the film. And when they come to a realization of that and they have a confrontation with some of the remaining members that were not. Uh, involved in the violence. Um, there's a, a, a twist on what you expected. I, I totally expected the scene to go one way and it did not. And it went very real, very human, very much what, you know, you, people are allowed to show their emotions on their sleeve as opposed to putting up the front that you are used to them seeing. Again, I'm being very vague with it because I think the moment's <laughs> pretty powerful if you don't expect it coming. But, um, there were that scene and there's a couple of others too. That I think that just really were powerful um, and really worked for me. So again, I do think this is a film going in without the, the heightened expectations and knowing that it may take a little while to settle with you too. It, it did for me again, I was not necessarily going to plan to see it the second night, kind of decided to sit down, got a little rope back into it. And then after the second viewing, I'm, 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 I'm a huge fan. So yeah, it is one that rewards, I think people coming back to it. Um, Anything else? Any other comments you've got? Any other feedback? Uh, no, on? no, that kind of captures up with all the points I was going to make. I think, you know, I need to add it to my watch again before the end of the year. Um, I do like the film, but I wonder if it will kind of rise. I mean, it already has just thinking on some of the themes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was just the initial frustration of, you know, running time. I felt like first feature kind of got in the way, you know, the fact that it was a first feature, but 
you know, what does that matter? And I think if I was able to kind of rewatch it, my mm-hmm. feelings would probably you know, change a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, that is The Last Black Man in San Francisco, uh, directed by Joe Talbot and starring Jimmy Fails. Uh, it has been playing in some select cities. I think it was released in limited release back in June. So it's been expanding a bit and showing around. But uh, even if you're not living in a big city where it's playing, it will probably be available online within a, a couple months, I would imagine, for people to see as well. So now let's move on to our second movie review, which is the film crawl the state of florida has issued a category five hurricane warning all residents must evacuate immediately grab your families your loved ones and get out dad we won't be able to come for you dad In Crawl, a young woman, while attempting to save her father during a Category 5 hurricane, finds herself trapped in a flooding house and must fight for her life against alligators, as you may have guessed if you've seen any of the trailer or from what you just heard. Um, This is the first film that I've ever seen by Alexandre Aha. He has done other horror-type films. He actually did a film called Piranha a couple years ago. I've never seen it. Piranha 3D, I believe, right? Okay. Yeah, it was Could Piranha be. 3D. <laughs> so I don't mean, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a third of the series. Okay. So Mr. Aha, he is known for doing, you know, horror type genre films. This one, you know, it is kind of a creature feature. In the past, uh, Alan, you kind of talked about creature features that you've liked in, with varying degrees of success, like Godzilla, for example. Mm-hmm. And this movie, it is, it is what it is on the face. You know, it's, it's a movie with an alligator chasing after people you know, pretty pretty simplistic. Um, I think in general, all the, these animals are not talking, which would kick it up another notch because Alan likes talking animal movies. I do like talking animal movies, um, but no, these do not talk. So. How how was your uh, how was your time with Crawl? <laughs> I had a fun time with it. I, I uh, it is what it is. It is uh, uh, um, it takes place in. Somewhat one location, although they they branch outside of that one location uh, a few occasions after you get through some some setup at the beginning. Um, you really have to evaluate a film like this on did it did it do what it was set out to do, which is uh, give you a you know a, a scary intense situation with killer crocodiles and. By that definition, if I'm not looking for anything else, if I'm not looking for any outstanding performances, I'm not looking for any character development, I just want thrills and scares and a uh, interesting location, meaning underneath the house of the house. I, I think it succeeded in that. So I actually had a pretty good time with it. Uh, I thought it was relatively scary, you know, uh, and intense at times. I thought... Uh, uh, can be it got to be a little brutal at times, which again, you know, I think kind of matched the the genre they were going for. Um, yeah, there were problems. Yeah, there were things that did not work as well. But as an overall experience, I would give it a very uh, slight pass <laughs> to others. So, a slight pass. A slight pass. I mean, you know, I'm not going to recommend that everybody goes out and sees this film because I mean, it's not for everybody, and it's. Pretty much on the surface, if you see the trailer and you like what you see, okay, I think you're going to have a pretty good time. Uh, if, they, if you're looking for something more, it is not there, and you will not get it. So uh, I, will, I will give that a pass by that definition. So, Chris, how about you? I, I'm, I got a feeling uh, you and I may be on different polls on this one. So, I, As much as I wanted to, I like to surprise myself. I don't typically go out to see horror movies or I don't, you know, this, or thrillers. They're just not my... Not my cup of tea, not my cinematic cup of tea. I, you know, I, you'd mentioned this film. I could tell you were excited about it. I was like, you know what? Sure. It's summertime, you know, an action film. I just actually recently been down to the coast of North Carolina. So kind of, and actually, uh, I was at Hilton Head. We saw signs saying, be careful of the alligators. So, yeah. you know, I was like, you know what? This could be kind of a fun, fun movie. And I wish I had had fun, um, but I, I really didn't. The most mm. ingenious thing about the film for me was the fact that they called it Crawl, and it takes place in a crawl space underneath the house. <laughs> Outside of that, and there are alligators I didn't even make crawling that around. I didn't Outside even of make that, that, I just really, I was bored. <laughs> and, you know, in a 
in an action movie, in a horror movie, you know, whether or not you can believe what's going on, whether or not the acting is good or bad, you don't want to be bored. You don't want to ever be bored in a movie, hopefully. But especially in like a movie that's set up like this, I I don't expect to be bored. And when I am, I'm I'm really disappointed. The opening of this movie, you talked about how, you know, setting the scene and then it does go down to a crawl space. Mm-hmm. But the kind of setup I found pretty interesting. And actually the opening that is at a swim meet at the University mm-hmm. of Florida, I thought it was really stylistically shot, kind of the mm-hmm. way they would put the titles and things up on the screen. I was like, whoa, this is not what I expected. This is going for something. Hooray. You know, I was like, awesome. You know, I kind of got excited. And then after that, things kind of started to, to drop off. And then once we got into the confined space of that basement, I just got bored. I did, you know, and you talk about being, you know, with this type of movie, scared mm-hmm. or find it thrilling. The original first time the alligator kind of jumps out, yes, I did jump out of my seat. But other than that, I just felt that the action was pretty much redundant and I and I was bored. Hmm. Okay. So. I, I can't say I was bored. I do think the action, the, the pacing of the film was a little off and that it would go through its little peaks and valleys where you had a few moments of like a lot of uh, extreme thrill, violence action, and then several large swath, swaths where they really nothing happened. So it never got me to the point of saying I was bored, but it definitely was some more ups and downs with the, uh, the pacing of the film. Um, I, I like the opening, too. I, I think the lead actress, uh, Kea Scolidario, was pretty good. I mean, uh, you know, she she had a <laughs> she, well, she was I'm not going to she wasn't bad, but she just wasn't given a whole other Well, than I mean, like as far as but you know, to to show I'm looking more I guess the physicality of the role of I see. you know, having to yell and fight and uh, yeah, she, I think she did really really well with that. You know, Barry Pepper plays her dad, which Good old Barry Pepper. Good old Barry Pe- Not a lot to do here either. He had even less to do than she did. And it was really just like- just lay down on the ground and, and be hurt. <laughs> you know, basically <laughs> was a lot of his role. Uh, there's really, I mean, nobody else had any real sizable role in the film. Sure. A few passing police officers and other bystanders that are uh, that were affected. So, um, but yeah, so I think uh, overall, you know, uh, I, I'm giving it a pass just because I do think it was... It was, uh, I mean, it was an hour and 25 minutes. So it was also a relatively short film. It was. So, you know, if you're not going to have a lot more going on in the film other than the one premise, you know, no need to stretch it out to two hours or more. Let's, let's tidy this up. Let's make it nice and quick. And I think they did a good job of that. The film moved, I felt like at a pretty brisk pace. And, uh, you know, I, were there any surprises? Was there anything that really kind of stick with me after the film? No, not really. Actually, Kind of going into the film, I predicted exactly where the film was going to end, and I was boop, right on the money. I mean, it was actually down to the shot almost. Wow. I kind of expected, oh, I bet they're going to end up at this place, and that's going to be the last shot of the film. I'm like, yep, and there we are. That's the end of the film. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I kind of look at it this way, Chris. When you go in uh, to buy something in the store, and you have a really clear idea of what it is you want, and this is what it's going to be, And once you've bought it, it's going to function in this way. Mm -hmm. And you would actually be kind of, in a way, disappointed if it didn't function the way you anticipated it to. It's kind of how I see this film. I knew what it was going into it. I expected it to perform it a certain way. It did, almost to the T. It ended exactly how I would have predicted it to end. Would it have been nice to have a surprise or two? Yes. Would it have been nice to have something a little more unique going on? Sure. But in the end of the day, it delivered on its ultimate promise in the trailer and all. And I'm, I'm fine with it for that. (laughs) (laughs) I was, I was surprised a little bit at the CGI of the actual storm itself, the alligator creature effects. And when they were underwater and they were showing the alligators swimming around or the humans interacting with them, that all looked fine to me. But what is surprised about is how specifically the sky mm-hmm. um, just looked really, really, really fake. Hmm. And I don't know if it's because they had to blank out like airplanes flying around or actual cityscapes and had to blank that out and put a storm there and make it in this neighborhood, supposedly mm-hmm. down in Florida. 
but it just really bothered me. Anytime they showed outside, not in the early part when she's like traveling to the house when they're like blocking off roads and stuff, that was fine. But something about showing the sky and showing outside the house, it just looked really interesting. Really fake to me. Didn't really notice that. Um, You know, you talk about alligator effects and I'll say when the alligators are underwater, Swimming and and more in a natural uh, yes, I thought they worked really well. I will say that you know yeah when you first even the first time we see the alligator uh, it's a little it's a little rubbery it's a little <laughs> yeah I don't know if this is as naturally as the alligators would move uh, in the in these situations sure but again I, I think you kind of have to give the film a little bit of that because they they had to turn these creatures alligators are typically. You know, they're the kind of animals when you see them out, they don't really look like they have a lot of expressiveness, you know, in anything. They're very statuesque, you right. know, in a lot of times. So you had to add a little personality to the to the alligators in a film like this. And I think I think they did the balance pretty well. The, the animation wasn't bothersome and I didn't look like feel like it's it, it hurt the film at all. But, you know, if you really wanted to focus in and get nitpicky on it, it was a little a little shady in a few places. But um Overall, I, hey, I had a good time with it. You know, it was an hour and a half. It was fine. It was a, uh, it had some decent, fun little thrills here and there that I liked, and um, but pretty predictable, pretty uh, where I expected it to go. So, yeah, the camera work, some of the camera work underneath the house, creating this sense of a tight space. I did admire that. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought they did a good job of trying to provide various angles and various, I don't know, attack ways of attack for the crocodile or just, you know, keeping it visually interesting as much as they could staying within the space. But I guess where a little bit of my letdown came Mm -hmm. from is you are boxing yourself in when you put in this confined space type idea. And for an example, another movie that uses this idea, not with a crocodile, but it was a movie called Don't Breathe that was actually produced by a guy who produced this film. Mm-hmm. And that was a home it was a home invasion type. It was a home invasion thriller. Mm-hmm. And basically people go in this house and they can't get out and all this kind of stuff happens. But they're confined into the house. But they thought up of enough different ideas to kind of keep things fresh. Okay. And that was it with this movie. It was like, other than, you know, there's, oh, there's some eggs down here. And that, you know, that's even hinted at in the trailer. But it doesn't like go far enough Mm. into an area of interest with that. There is something that at one point you see some people across the street that are looting because of Mm. this, this, you know, hurricane that's going on. And that potentially could have provided some interesting thing as trying to use them as rescuers. So there was possibilities, but the film just wasn't interested in that. And Mm. that's fine. But it, it's like I kind of from the beginning of the movie the fact that they had set it up with that really cool swim meet idea, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, okay, this is gonna this is gonna try to achieve something. Yeah. But then just to dash my hopes, I was I was irritated. And like the scene where the, you see those people shoplifting or looting, you're like, oh, they're gonna try to do, but no, they're just not interested in that. No, they're so, they're. Uh- <laughs> Red shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so just yeah. you know, not necessarily tone of the film, yeah. except for, you know, and if you're going into the movie, like, you know, when you watch the room, you kind of know like, okay, this is a low budget, you know, B movie or D movie. You know? mm-hmm. And with this though, I just didn't get that feel. And when they cut to the song with the credits at the end of the movie, <laughs> yeah, that was so, <laughs> It was like this happy go lucky. I can't remember the name of the song. Oh, it's a, a see you later alligator. There you go. Yeah, and it's just, Bill Haley. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, just really, it was kind of like the last, like, eh, we got your money type thing. <laughs> That's what it was to me. And I was like, yes, you did. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, I actually thought I kind of chuckled when that came up on there. I'm like, oh. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and see if that's the type of yeah. film that had been all along and it was making on purpose, trying to get you to roll your eyes at coincidences yeah. or things like that. Yeah. No, and I then think to have that yeah. kind of campy song. It just didn't, didn't fit for me. I, uh, I, I, again, I had a good time with the film. <laughs> it is what it is. Not anything I really need to see again. Uh, and if people rec- if people ask me for a recommendation on it, the whole stipulation I'm going to use is, yeah, watch the trailer. If you like this, if you want to see an hour and a half of this, 
Sure. Check it out. I think you'll have a good time. If you want something more than what the, t- the trailer's telling you, something that you know, strives for great, greater uh, ambitions, then you're not going to get it. Just don't even waste your time. So that's kind of where I am with that. And again, I'll, I'll say I think uh, I, I think the Kaya uh, Scodelario uh, as the lead actress. I, I think there's some potential there. I think she's she's got some she's got some chops that were slightly hinted at. Wasn't given a lot to do in the film, obviously, but I think she's she's got an interesting presence on screen. So she does. I mean, she's kind of a instead of uh, Sigourney Weaver being Ripley, it's kind of this girl being. Yeah. You know, she's kind of like playing that instead of against aliens, it's against alligators. But they're you know. She just wasn't given quite enough to do, but no, she's definitely sure. definitely a presence on screen. Yeah, I, I think I that. think she may be someone to watch. You know, that could be doing some interesting things in the future as well. So, all right, well, that is crawl. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have our movie news of the episode and uh, our recommendations for uh, this episode. So, stay tuned. You're listening to Foot Candle Films. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Andrew Moose from the Street Circle Drive podcast here on The Mesh. Interested in promoting your business to an online audience? Your ad could be right here. Consider advertising on The Mesh Podcast Network. Head over to themesh.tv for details. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on themesh.tv. Chris and I just finished our two reviews of films, and now let's move into some movie news. Chris, this is the part of the show where one of us will bring up some news items. It's now my turn. I get to bring up the news items this week and uh, bringing up a couple of items of either films that are close to release or ones that are in development status. And uh, we're going to kind of tackle them in that order. So the first news item I want to share with you, let me first kind of play a little clip from a trailer for a film called Honey Boy. You have good instincts. I have good instincts? Yeah, you I got rodeo instincts. clown instincts. Well, I could never make it in Hollywood. You could if you start when I did. How do you think it feels to have my son paying me? How do you think that feels? You wouldn't be here if I didn't pay you. So that is the trailer for a film called Honey Boy. And Chris, you mentioned that maybe you'd had a little bit of knowledge about this film before. But for those in listening that maybe aren't familiar with it, um, it is a film starring Shia LaBeouf. Now, Shia LaBeouf, I'm going to say right now, seems to be maybe trying to get into a little bit of a resurgence with his career. He kind of had some some time period where, you know, the, the projects were a little more varied, a little more uh, spread apart. And also he had a lot more personal things that he was getting more attention for than probably the actual film work he was doing. But we have a film coming out uh, here very, very shortly called uh, The Peanut Butter Falcon that he is in that he's getting some good acclaim for that I'm sure we will be hearing about or possibly even talking about in the next few months. But this is another film called Honey Boy. And it is uh, you heard in the trailer uh, the adult in the in the scene was Shia LaBeouf, and he's basically playing a version of his own father, which means the child that we heard in the trailer was a fictionalized version of himself. Now, although he's not directing the film, uh, the story is very much inspired by his life. And he says he wrote it. He wrote it, fun. yeah. So it's his life. And in the trailer, we even see a child actor who is on a – Child's TV show and having a pie in the face, which was very much, I think, even Steven was the show that he used to be on on Disney Channel, Disney, I believe. Right. Then you see him also in a big action movie at the beginning of the trailer, which, of course, he did all the Transformers movies, at least those first three. So to see him play uh, play his own father in a story about himself, which doesn't appear from the trailer that the film is really meant to be super flattering either, no. which is kind of a gutsy move as well. Uh, has this piqued your interest? Have you got some interest in the film now after kind of seeing and hearing about it? I, I, I am interested. I, I think Shia LaBeouf, some of the stuff that he's done that has not the Transformer stuff, which I could care less about, but some of the stuff that came after that, he was in both parts of uh, Nymphomaniac, Lars yep. von Trier's True. movie, which I saw um, which was interesting. Um, he's done something else. That I think a film that was, oh, um, American Honey mm-hmm. he was in that I saw. Yep. Um, so, and then just the stuff that he's done kind of random. It was kind of, um, who's the guy that uh, Man on the Moon was about? Um, that movie with, oh my goodness. Oh, Andy. Uh, Andy Kaufman. Andy Thank Kaufman, you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so 
He's kind of done some very a little performance art. He did a performance thing, yeah. art installation. I think it was in L.A. Mm-hmm. where you could walk in and pay like ten dollars, and I think you could go and like yell at him. He had a paper bag on his I head. Think and, throw things at him. And you and could all, throw yeah. things at him. Like all the. It was just <laughs> you know really interesting thing. Then he did the stuff where it was for our school. I think he did this. Uh, inspirational video where he was like, you can do it, just do it. He yelled in front of a green screen and then let students take that and do stuff with it. (laughs) Um, Just very odd. Yeah. So then for him to do peanut butter Falcon and then to turn around and do this. Yeah. I, I am definitely interested. Uh, I think, I think he is a talented actor. I guess we'll find out from honey boy, how troubled he was behind the scenes. Um, What's going to be interesting to me with this, which the trailer I guess doesn't really tell you gives you the idea that the father is not, is not a very flattering portrayal. The father doesn't appear to be from the, from the two and a half minute trailer is how flattering the portrayal of the son is. Yeah. Um, which there are hints that maybe it's not going to be that flattering of him either. Um, I don't know. Which is interesting. That's what I'm more curious about. I want to know, is this a film to kind of, Exonerate him, exonerate him sure. from some of his past challenges, or is this a going to be an unflattering look at truly like what's been going on? Sure, I hope it's the latter. I hope it's not a we come out all feeling sympathetic for Shia LaBeouf and it's all his father that was just. Uh, you know, I, I hope it's a little more real and nuanced than that. But sure. we'll see. Um, I do agree from the trailer. It does look like that. It, it's not meant to be flattering on either on any side. And the fact um, that the trailer was a red band trailer makes you think this is going to be a pretty hard R. Uh, I would assume so. Okay. I mean, the trailer itself was already a hard R. So sure. <laughs> it was, uh, true. you know, yes, it, I think it will be. Um, it's coming from Amazon Studios, which means that you know, yes, I think it is playing at you know festivals and getting all some attention there. But there's a good chance that it might actually show on Amazon quicker for people that don't get to see it in some of the big cities, because I'm sure it will not be probably a big wide release film. Gotcha. So, uh, kind of interesting. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm not really familiar with hardly anybody else associated with the film, even the act, the uh, director. I'm not, uh, although only other one is FKA twigs. Are you familiar with her at all? She is a I dancer know. and singer, uh, very talented. Apple did a, a really stylized commercial with, um, who was the director? Shoot, uh, being John Malkovich director. Oh, uh, Spike Jones. Spike Jones. Yeah, Spike Jones did a almost like a two three minute music video commercial for when the HomePod came out, the music system they came out with. She was the dancer, the lead in that that short film where she's dancing in her apartment, and then her apartment kind of expands into a big color tunnel, and just it was a really cool cool film. Okay. But that was her. And uh, she is going to be featured in the film as a neighbor and friend to the younger kid. So um, that's the only other names I'm, I'm familiar with. So it really seems to be Shia LaBeouf and that's the only name associated with it, but it should be, uh, I'm very curious about the film itself. Is there, I wonder the kid actor who's playing young LaBeouf, is mm-hmm. he, is this his first film? I wonder. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar. I'm not okay. sure. Oh, Lucas Hed- Lucas Hedges. Is playing him as the older adult, uh, as the older man, the, older the one LaBeouf. we saw in the yeah, trailer, yeah, sure. the one in the action scene at the sure. beginning. So, okay, Lucas Hedges, he's, he's Manchester a, by the Sea, yeah. uh, several other films he's been in. So that is a, a bigger name there. Uh, Noah Jupe is him as the younger one. Hmm. And the only other film he was in is he was in A Quiet Place. Oh. The John Tr- okay. Krasinski film. Yeah, so, sure. So we got some other actors in there. But um, anyway, interesting. I sure. just, you know, absolutely. I, I, I am interested and, in, uh, I love films about behind the scenes, Hollywood behind the scenes with actors or people in the film industry. And this looks like it could be an interesting one. Sure. All right. Let me move on to our second, uh, story. And this one, I'm just, it's really interesting to me. Disney. Have you heard of the Disney company? Name? I have. Okay. They have, <laughs> in case anybody's curious. They have a lot of things they do, films, TV, theme parks, merchandising, everything. What don't they do? They seem to do pretty well. I think they, they're they fairly successful business. However, they took a little bit of a hit lately. The streaming service? No, thing. not yet. Yeah. The streaming service, I think, actually is going to be very successful for okay. them. No, they actually had to uh, suffer a quarter three loss, believe okay. it or not. 
This is the same company that's put out The Lion King. They put out the Marvel movies, like the biggest mm-hmm. movies this Avengers year. Avengers Endgame. Yeah. However, their film uh, area did take a loss, mainly because of three little letters. F-O-X, Fox. They bought Fox Studios. Uh, that was finalized earlier in the year. Gotcha. Fox was the studio that released a film called Dark Phoenix, the <laughs> X-Men movie. Right. Which lost a lot of money. Right. <laughs> there are some other Fox movies that did not do very well. Basically, they absorbed all that into the mix. So, uh, thanks to Fox. So, was Disney. Fo- Fox made a crappy Dark Phoenix just to kind of get back at Disney? I, no, I don't know, no, but they, they it, it worked if that was the, if that was the plan. <laughs> so, Disney... <laughs> Disney announced just this week that, you know, since absorbing Fox and suffering that loss and, and they're filing that, you know, for bankruptcy, <laughs> right? Yes. They're <laughs> shutting down. No, they are. Uh, they basically have said, you know, we, we've just had to redo the whole Fox lineup of films that were in development. Hmm. Okay. So they've scrapped a whole bunch of films that were supposed to be underway. Hmm. Fox was already in early development on these films. So we're going to be seeing said, documentaries of all these frustrated filmmakers. In possibly the so. Okay. Um, and some of these projects were kind of interesting ones. Okay. So I'm a little, it's a little discouraging. Now that's not to say they couldn't come back and be retooled and redone, but they're basically wiping their hands and saying, you know what? These Fox properties that we don't feel like are going to, that we didn't have our hands in, in the, from the beginning, we're just going to shut them down. Okay. So you had a couple of interesting films. There was actually going to be a film called Mouse Guard. That was going to be <laughs> okay. a uh, adaptation of a comic series mm-hmm. um, with Matt Reeves on board as a producer. He's the one that's going to be doing the new Batman movie. Okay. Um, and included Idris Elba and Andy Serkis in the film. Uh, so that one's shut down. But not but not animated. It was a live action. Um, uh, that may have been animated, actually. Oh, okay. I mean, it's about a bunch of mice, so it might okay. have been animated. Mouse guard. Um, yeah. Gambit, which is an X-Men superhero character. For the longest time, Channing Tatum has been attached to play the Raging Cajun. That is his nickname. <laughs> and uh, He throws cards. He throws energized, kinetic playing cards. Okay. Just got to clarify, <laughs> sure, that. clarify I that. I just don't want people to think there's a superhero out there just that just takes a deck of cards, cards and, and just <laughs> throws them at people. <laughs> There is a little more to it than sure. that. Okay. okay. But uh, Gambit was in development at Fox for a long time. Now, granted, Disney now owns the whole Marvel Universe, which includes the X-Men, which includes Gambit. But they gotcha. still said, you know what? This one, it's been in development for too long. We've spent a lot. Fox has already spent a lot of money on it. We're just not going to deal with it right now. So, done. Channing Tatum, sorry. You got to find some other way to, to get your passion project on, uh, off the ground. <laughs> There's a film called News of the World that was going to be Tom Hanks, directed by Paul Greengrass. Um, Interesting. It was based on a best-selling no- a novel. It tells the story of Captain Jefferson Kyle Kidd, a pers- per- precursor to modern-day newscasters, and a 10-year-old girl he has been tasked with reuniting with her family. Um, hmm. That's not going to happen under Fox. Now, it does sound like it's being moved over to Universal, so it may still happen. But still, Fox, you know, Disney, Fox is saying, no, nah, we're not interested in the latest Tom Hanks film. Hmm. Um, and then there's also the other Fox Marvel films that have been kind of kicked around that are just, everything's just being kind of stopped. You know, it's just like, all right, Disney's kind of just doing a recalibration and saying, yeah, we're going we're gonna to wait and see what shakes out down the road before we let any too many of these other projects go forward. Hmm. Now, a couple others I thought were kind of interesting that still sound like they're going to go forward. Um, Steven Spielberg is doing a remake of West Side Story. That right. was going to be... I'd heard of that. That was going to be under Fox, but Disney has said, eh, we'll take that one. <laughs> so they are going to be now doing it under the Disney banner, it looks like. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, because we've all been clamoring for it, a Kingsman prequel... Oh, thank goodness. ...called The Great Game is also one that they say, yeah, we'll, we'll stick with that. Let's, let's keep that going. Disney's going to do that? Yeah. Hollywood reporters claiming that some movies that are all but guaranteed to move forward at Disney, including the Kingsman prequel and Steven Spielberg's remake of West Side Story. Did you ever see the second Kingsman? I did not. You saw the first one? I liked the first one. I thought the first one was okay. It was good, dumb fun. I liked it. I like spy movies. I like the spy genre. But I heard the second one was just too far gone. It was... 
the first Kingsman was just butted right up against the line where I would say, yeah, no, I don't like this anymore. Hmm. It just okay. tiptoed up to it. But I hear the second one went way beyond that line, and that's where I'm not interested. So, Fair enough. Um, and I know there's a third one coming out like soon that I have no interest in at this point. So. So anyway, just interesting how, you know, several high profile films are just shut down uh, and we all have Dark Phoenix to blame. <laughs> so really, the, the whipping boy. It's amazing to me how all the news now, granted, I think it's a lot more compounding factors than one movie losing millions of dollars. But sure. that's what all the news is kind of grabbing ahead is that, yep, this film lost the studio. Gosh, how much was it? I saw it up here earlier. Um there was so much money they lost off of that one singular film that they said that it caused them to rework their whole strategy wow. for films going forward, which I think is pretty amazing. So <laughs> Disney now owns, by the way, Avatar. There's supposedly new avatars coming up in the next couple of years. Wow. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah three, something like three or uh-huh. something. Yeah. Disney owns them now. Disney owns The Simpsons. Oh. Yeah. Because remember, Fox owned them. Fox. So they'll have to shut down that part of Universal <laughs> Studios in Florida. Could the be. Simpsons ride. Could be. Uh, Disney now owns National Geographic. I didn't realize Fox owned National Geographic. But, yeah. I don't think I realized that either. Anyway, yep, Disney owns just about everything now. So uh, yeah, there's no entertainment that Disney doesn't own. So basically, Disney's even having to look at their schedule of Star Wars movies and Marvel movies to now realize that they've also got to fit in. Avatar movies to make sure because that's very much hitting in the same uh, marketing demographic for them. So interesting times. I wonder when Avatar, the, a new Avatar movie, is finally going to come out. Uh, they keep delaying it so far back. Uh, Avatar to me, and I know this is a little bit off off the, the new subject, but I'm sorry. Uh, Avatar to me is so fascinating because it's up until recently it was the biggest film of all time. Which in game Avengers in game just beat it. But still, to be the biggest film of all time and probably the least talked about, <laughs> least revered blockbuster of all time that I can think of. I mean, really, I, I don't know anybody who says, I love Avatar. I cannot wait for the Avatar sequel. You don't see a lot of people wearing shirts with it. No. Or posters out or None toys of it. still being. No, it's gone. Absolutely not. It's amazing. But yet there's now three more films in development for James Cameron. I, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say, if that first one, the first sequel that comes out bombs, uh, I think we're going to hear a lot more red tape cutting of down of projects from <laughs> Disney at that point, too. But yeah. supposedly James Cameron was working on them all like kind of together. So right. it's not it was like, kind of like a Lord of the Rings type yeah, thing. Yeah. Right. I don't know. That's a big gambit. And I know the billions of dollars that the first Avatar made are really enticing to the studio to say, yeah, we got to keep doing this. But it's been what? Eight years? Well, seven eight actually, years? Disney I mean, has an Avatar ride now. They, they do at the uh, yeah. Animal Kingdom yeah. park. But, I mean, it's been so many years since Avatar came out. I just And it was already pretty forgettable after it was done anyway. So I, I don't have a good feeling about the sequels. I think the sequels <laughs> are going to be, not to say whether they're good or not. Sure. I just think they're going to be really bad business, my personal prediction. Okay. Okay, that is all the news I've got. The Shia LaBeouf resurgence. And then the whole uh, Disney Fox acquisition and the cutting of the slate of films due to that. Is this going to be the year of LaBeouf? (laughs) It could be. I mean, it could be. I I don't know. I mean, I agree with you. The guy's done some interesting projects in the last uh, over the last several years. But while he's been doing those sporadic, interesting projects, he's also had the personal Personal travails going on. If this is him trying to wipe that slate clean, say, "Look, I'm I'm focused back on my film craft, and here's what I can do." And he's turning out some good projects. Uh, could be interesting. Yeah. Could be very, very interesting. Chris, we're at the part of the show where you and I give our recommendation for the episode. We both uh, pick a film that we've either caught back up with recently or just want to remind people about. Or a, a one that's maybe online that nobody's heard of yet. And give that recommendation. So, Chris, how about since I did both the news items, why don't you start us off with the recommendation for this episode? So, I'm going to recommend a movie that probably not too many people have heard of. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's about a woman who's forced to go on the run when her superhuman abilities are discovered. Years after abandoning her family, the only place she has left to hide is home. That is the summary given by IMDb. The movie is Fast Color. Um, It stars an actress whose name is a lot of fun to say, 
Gugu Mbatha-Ra. <laughs> yeah, David Strathern's in it as well. Uh, Gugu Mbatha-Ra plays the lead character in the film. She plays Ruth. Um, it, this is is a g- pretty interesting film. You know, it seems like something that would be at home in like the doomed X-Men franchise, I guess you could say. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but it really centers around family. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, you can tell it's an independent film, doesn't have a lot of stars in it. The effects are not what you would see in probably Dark Phoenix that had a lot more money to make. But uh, I thought it was, I thought it was worthwhile. And it's one of those films too that I, I liked it, obviously, that's why I'm recommending it. It kind of leaves itself where it could be open for a sequel, but I really hope it doesn't have one. Mm, <laughs> I kind of yeah. hope it's its own self-contained little thing. Um, and interesting too, it um, the leads are you know African American, so it's kind of like an Afri- It's kind of like a independent Black Panther, if you can imagine mm-hmm. that. Not that it's different, you know, as far as having African Americans at the center of the film in the genre would be sci-fi. It's still yeah. semi-unique. Mm-hmm. Um, so. That's my recommendation, is uh, Fast Color. All right, here's a little bit of the trailer, too. This woman can affect the energy of the Earth. Ruth, we can help you. There are tests we can run. So that is Fast Color. That is Chris's recommendation. Available online, correct? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, let me move on to mine. Mine is going to be dipping back in the well a little bit. Um, so Christopher Nolan is a writer director. I've that, heard of him. Yes, he's he's pretty good. <laughs> um, he's made some films that many people are big fans of. He has a new film coming out. I believe. I don't know if it's in December or early next year, but Tenet. Tenet. Oh, yeah. You're recommending that? Alan, have you traveled to the future? I have. I've gone to the future, and I've seen it, and it's good. (laughs) (laughs) Right. No, um, I could probably go ahead and just make that prediction and be probably pretty close to right on that. Sure. Um, But it is a a film that a lot of people are looking forward to. I think the first teaser, like a truly teaser trailer, was attached to movie theater prints of Hobbs and Shaw last weekend, which Hmm. we did not see, so we haven't seen them. But it's John David Washington playing uh, a lead, and it's supposedly a spy thriller. <laughs> it's very vague, the description. Sure. And I supposedly the teaser trailer doesn't really tell much about it either. But it got me thinking. My youngest son is, is 12 years old, and he's uh, got a very sophisticated taste when it comes to films. He likes a lot of the films I like, not by me pressuring them. He truly, honestly, like, he likes Christopher Nolan films. Interstellar is one of his favorites. Okay. Uh, he also really likes The Prestige. I need to revisit Interstellar. Yeah, he really likes The Prestige. I think that was one of his favorites of his up until then. But one I realized he had not seen was Inception. Now, I will say this. When we when I saw Inception... I, did we review that on I'm the sure show? we did. Okay. And I was kind of mixed on it. Oh, I, I, and I remember I loved it. Yeah, well, I, I thought it was... Fine. (laughs) I mean, I just, I I maybe, I don't know what I was going into with expectation wise, but I just remember thinking it was maybe longer than I would have wanted and got a little more complex than it was hard to follow on things. But I knew my son really likes Christopher Nolan films. I'm like, look, that's one you need to check out. So let's rent it and watch it. And so we did. And I got to watch it for the first time since it came out. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> it, it, I think kind of knowing what I was getting into and knowing the premise of the film, I really paid attention to following the storyline. And once I got the hang of it, I was totally wrapped back into it. And yes, it is very, very good. All um, I remember is the year it came out, I dressed up as the Leonardo DiCaprio character for Halloween. So yeah. that just shows you. How I'm sure everybody on the block knew exactly who you were, <laughs> of too. Right? So yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it's a good, good movie. I, I, I feel bad for not giving it a fair shake maybe the first time around when I saw it. But it's right up there with, with other Nolan works. And, uh, yeah, it was good. The, you know, the effects still hold up. You know, the use of the effects for this mind-bending dream reality. You know, for anybody who maybe is not as familiar with the film or, or, or not sure, it is Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, yeah, it's a huge cast. Oh, yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio. We have, um, oh gosh, hold on. Joseph um, Gordon-Levitt. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. We've got also um, 
uh, who was the guy who played Bane. Um, yeah, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy's in it. That's right. Tom Hardy's in it. Uh, shoot, I'm looking at the crew. I'm sorry. Hold Who's on. Who's the female in it? Uh, the Ellen? female, Ellen Page. Ellen Page, that's right. Uh, Ken Watatambi, uh, Cillian Murphy. Yeah. Marion Cotillard, oh, Michael yeah. Caine. Yeah, it's so loaded, it's loaded kind of it. it's actually a lot of his other characters he brings in from other films. Every single one of them, except Leonardo DiCaprio and Ellen Page, has been in other Nolan films. Oh, Batman cast. Yeah, Batman cast, and uh, yeah, you're right. Actually, a lot of them are from the Batman films. And he made this, I think, in between his Batman trilogy, if I remember correctly. It might maybe have been in between after Dark Knight and between Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises. Rises maybe I yeah. think that's about right. Uh, but the idea of the film is, you know, Cobb, who is Leonardo DiCaprio, Dom Cobb, uh, he's a skilled thief, and they commit espionage, corporate espionage, by going into the subconscious dreams of their targets and being able to kind of pull information. The idea of an inception is they're given a job where they're actually designed to place an idea into somebody's subconscious um, and let that subconscious idea germinate and take form over over time. To do that, they have to go deep into dreams. And it may sound very fantastical, the concept, but it's made to be very, seem very authentic, the process here when they're, when they're going by it. And you kind of buy into it kind of quickly. Like right yeah. then with the first scene, you're like, okay, so this is what they're doing. And they have the technology to do this. So this so. can really happen. Cool. Okay. All right. And you just kind of go with it. And once you let go and go with it, it's a really great thrill ride. And I love the fact of thinking, trying to explain to my son, the whole last, I don't know, 30 minutes of this movie mm. is a scene taking place in three different dreams simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And understanding that this is all happening in the span of like a couple of seconds in real life, because the dream world kind of keeps every level you go down. It's you're dreaming a lot, a lot longer story that only takes place in a very short amount of time in real life. Right. That concept kind of blew his mind. <laughs> He's like, wait, but, what? <laughs> like, we had to stop it a few times and kind of walk through what was going. But it is a really good film. Uh, 2010 directed by Christopher Nolan. So we're coming uh, up on a 10 year anniversary. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's been out for a little while. That's one of those films. Yeah, I think we maybe reviewed that. It would have might been, have been early earlier, on in the show. But yeah. that's an example of, you know, the Chris Fry movie. If you want to see a movie that's kind of like totally in my wheelhouse, was my expectations were high, and somehow the movie managed to live up to it. That would be Inception. Yeah, no, it really was. And I probably went in with super high expectations as much as I love Batman Begins and The Prestige. Maybe felt a little bogged down by the film. But giving it some time, giving it some distance, revisiting it, yes, it's absolutely great film, classic, well done. Uh, yeah, highest recommendation. It's a good, good flick. So I believe that wraps us up for today. We gave our two recommendations. Chris gave one for Fast Color. I gave one for the film Inception. And uh, then we had our movie reviews earlier in the show and our news items in the middle. And uh, that's kind of our format. That's what we do. And we'll plan on doing it again before too long. But Chris, in the meantime, before we get back together for another episode, people have some feedback or thoughts. They'd like to talk to us about either of the films we reviewed or any of the news items. How do they go about doing that? You can send us an email to info at the mesh dot TV with foot can on the subject line. You can also keep up with us on Twitter. I'm at Chris Fry at and Alan is at Alan Jackson. And there's also at foot candle film. Alan and I are also on Letterboxd where we track what films we've been watching recently. Please also consider subscribing to this show on iTunes and leave a star rating or review to help us reach new listeners. We're also on Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play Podcasts. Is there not nearly enough film life, film in your life? Is that a problem you're having? <laughs> if so, why not attend the 2019 Foot Candle Film Festival that's going on September 27th through the 29th? You can find out more information about this event, which is near and dear to our hearts, obviously, at footcandlefilmfestival.com. Go there for you know tickets and information. That's right. It's going to be a fun weekend in the fall of this year here in the uh, foothills of North Carolina, western North Carolina, just a little northwest of Charlotte, North Carolina. It's where we are, and we'll have a great weekend of films. 35 films? Is that what we are uh, slating? That's correct. Yep. 35 films visiting filmmakers, 
uh, shorts, documentaries, features, just a, 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 it will be a great mixture of film experiences over the weekend. So we are looking forward to that. Uh, Chris mentioned the website to go to, but uh, drop us a line. Let us know if you're planning on coming to the festival weekend or buying tickets, and we'd, we'd love to make sure we connect with you while you're in town. All right, so we will go ahead and wrap up this week's show. We will be back again sometime in the next couple weeks with another episode, some more reviews to, to go through. Uh, Until then, thanks for listening, and we'll look forward to talking to you next time. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.